Hello everyone, welcome to Unacademy. My name is Shreya Sai, I'm an educator at Unacademy. You can follow me on the learning app where you can see my new set of courses, also courses by awesome educators. So moving on with our course, let's have a lesson about regeneration. Sounds like an interesting topic, right? So let's move on with it. Let's see what are the different types of regeneration and what does regeneration have its outcome in the power plants. So let's move on and please don't forget to rate, review and recommend this lesson as well as subscribe us on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Guys, let's move on with the topic power plant engineering. I've given my intro already. This is my Unacademy user platform. You can follow me over there. Introduction to power plant engineering part 1 is the course. So what are the target audience for this course? Uh, the target audience for this course will be mainly engineering students, general audience who are interested in thermal engineering topics, people who are interested in mechanical entities, people who are interested in energy resources and environmental enthusiasts. So what are the learning outcomes of this course of this lesson or presentation? You guys will come to know the effect of variation of steam condition on thermal efficiency of a steam power plant. What is reheating of steam? What is regeneration? What, is, what are turning cycles and ideal regenerative cycles? And at lastly, what is a regenerative feed water heating? Let's move on with our lesson regeneration. Let's have a quote. Regeneration can come only through a change of heart in the individual. A philosophical quote. Let's move on. So moving on, the effect of variation of steam condition on thermal efficiency of a steam power plant. The variation of Rankine efficiency with the inlet steam pressure at a constant temperature of 470 degrees centigrade happens at three condenser pressures. It is seen that for inlet steam pressures above 100 bar, there is continuing but decreasing rate of improvement of cycle efficiency. The increase in steam pressure is limited by considerations of mechanical stresses and ensuring of higher cost of the equipment. It also demonstrates that there is considerable improvement in cycle efficiency with the decrease of condenser pressure. Such a decrease mainly depends upon the available water cooling temperature and thus on the climatic condition of the place. Moving on, a lower cooling water temperature gives lower condenser pressure it also follows with the identical steam conditions and the cycle and similar equipment or the thermal efficiency of a condensing steam power plant will be less in a warm region than in a cold region. An increase in inlet steam temperature is also leading to an increase in the superheat at constant inlet steam pressure and condenser pressure which gives a steady improvement in the cycle efficiency. Raising the inlet steam temperature also reduces the wetness in the steam which also leads to improving the turbine internal efficiency. However, the increase in steam temperature is limited by the properties of the construction materials of boilers and turbines. The ultimate strength of unalloyed steel drops by about 30% as the steam temperature is raised from 400 to 500 degrees centigrade. Alloying with chromium and molybdenum and also by the use of austenitic instead of ferritic steels increases the strengths of high temperatures. Steam temperatures up to 620 degrees centigrade can be used in some power plants. It is also not satisfactory when the operating experience with expensive high temperature austenic steel bars are used. The maximum steam temperatures can be limited to 538 degrees centigrade and in few cases it can be limited to 565 degree centigrade. The maximum steam pressures or the throttle pressures can be used at three different condenser uh, pressures and two inlet steam temperatures. The turbine and internal efficiencies can be of 85% and the quality of turbine exhaust will be of 88%. For other values of NT, T1 and X2, the pressure limits can be readily determined by drawing the corresponding expansion line in a Molier diagram. So you can see here, this is the effect of inlet steam pressure and condenser pressure. You can see this is the Rankine efficiency and this is the pressure. You can see on 25 mm of Hg, on 50 mm of Hg and on 75 mm of Hg, the various curves obtained in this graph. So this is a table regarding the condenser pressure, how much it is uh, as shown in the graph and how much will be the turbine inlet steam temperatures when it is T1 is 500 degree centigrade and T2 is 550 degree centigrade. You can follow this table. Let's move on to reheating of steam. Reheating of steam is nothing but 
limiting the higher steam pressure in order to limit the quality to 0.88 of the turbine exhaust. In this case, all the steam after the partial expansion in the turbine is brought back to the boiler which is reheated by the combustion gases and then fed back to the turbine for further expansion. The flow is actually depending on the ideal Rankine cycle with reheat. In this reheat cycle, the expansion of steam from initial state 1 to the condenser pressure is carried out in two or more steps depending on the number of reheaters used. In the first step, the steam expands. So you can see here, this is a flow diagram of a reheater, reheat cycle. So moving on, in the first step, the steam expands in higher pressure turbine from the initial state to some intermediate process. The steam is then superheated at constant pressure in the boiler and the remaining expansion process that is the process 3 to 4S is carried out at low pressure turbine. Had the high, higher pressure been used without reheat, the cycle would have been 1 to 4 dashes to 5 to 6 dashes with lot of moisture at the turbine exhaust having quality x4 dashes that is the dryness fraction. With the use of reheat, the area is added to the basic cycle. It is seen that the network output of the plant increases with the reheat because the H3 minus H4 S is greater than the H2 S to the H4 dash S. Whether the cycle efficiency improves with reheat depends on whether the mean temperature of heat addition heat addition in the process 2s to 3 is higher than that in the process 6 to 1. But by increasing the number of reheats, still higher steam pressures can be used but the mechanical stresses increase in much higher proportion than the pressure because of the prevailing higher temperature. The cost and fabrication difficulties will also increase. So you can see here this is the formula which is used for this is the efficiency formula which is found by the reheating of the steam. You can see the reheat cycle, the TS, which I was telling the different states 1 to 4 dashes to 5 to 6s. You can see that here and also in the HS diagram over here. So reheating of steam actually increases the higher proportion of the mechanical stressors as already told cost and fabrication difficulties and also by the usage of two or more reheats results in cycle complication which increases the capital cost which are not justified by the improvement in cycle efficiency. So you can see here the effect of reheat pressure to cycle efficiency. You can see the delta efficiency over here, the T2S and the X4S the quality of steam over here. So that is what it also re re releases the pressure at which the steam is reheated and there is 0.2 to 0.25 of initial steam pressure it has to be maintained by the reheating of the steam or the quality of the steam. Let's move on to regeneration. In order to increase the mean temperature of heat addition and to reduce the external thermal irreversibility, attention was so far confined to increasing the amount of heat and also to reducing the amount of heat. The mean temperature of heat addition can also be increased by reducing the amount of heat added at lower temperatures in the economizer section of the steam generation with the attention focused in the process of heat transfer between the flue gas and the feed water. This irreversibility could be entirely eliminated if the feed water could be entered into the steam generator at saturated liquid state. This is possible by the process of regeneration in which energy is exchanged internally between the expanding fluid in the turbine and the compressing fluid in the heat addition which is before the heat addition. Let's move on to the Stirling cycle. Stirling cycle is a well known gas cycle which uses regeneration. It comprises of two reversible isotherms and two reversible isocores. There is heat addition at constant temperature T1 from an external source and heat rejection at constant temperature T2 to an external sink which takes place in the processes 4 to 1 and 2 to, 2, uh, 2 to 3 respectively. Regeneration occurs reversibly between the constant volume process that is 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 and the areas under the 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 denoting the heat lost by the expanded fluid and gained by the compressing, compressed fluid are equal. So the ideal Stirling cycle has the same efficiency as of the Carnot cycle. So you can see this what is the TS diagram of a Stirling cycle. You can see the process 1, 4, 2 and 3 and this is actually the constant volume process. Let's move on to, sorry, let's move on to ideal regenerative cycle. Following the Stirling cycle, the ideal regenerative cycle, in this the condensate after the leaving pump circulates 
After leaving the pump circulates around the turbine casing so that the heat is transformed from the vapor expanding in the turbine to the condensate circulating around it. It is assumed that this heat transfer process is reversible that is at each, at each point the temperature of the vapor is only infinitesimally higher than the temperature of the liquid. The process 1 to 2 thus represents reversible expansion of steam in the turbine with reversible heat rejection to the surrounding heat reversibly in the process 4 is to 5. So you can see here this is actually an ideal regenerative cycle the flow diagram of an ideal regenerative cycle. So the efficiency is equal to Carnot cycle, the pump work remains as same as Rankine cycle and the net work output in an ideal regenerative cycle is less. However, this cycle is not practicable because the reversible heat transfer cannot be realized in, in finite time in finite time, and heat exchanger in the turbine is mechanically impracticable and the moisture content of the steam turbine is high which actually leads to excessive corrosion. So you can see here this is the TS diagram of an ideal regenerative cycle. You can see the delta T over here, the delta SW and the delta S which is this area. This is actually the formula which is used for finding the pump work as well as the turbine work in an ideal regenerative cycle. So let's move on to regenerative water heating. It is actually by the usage of the heated uh, which is heated by the steam extractor that is the feed water enters the boiler at a temperature between stage 5 and 4s and is heated by steam extracted or bled from the intermediate stages of the turbine. The flow that is the TS and HS diagrams which I will show in the next slide with saturated steam at turbine inlet has two regenerative di direct contact feed waters and for 1 kg of steam turbine at the inlet M1 kg of steam is extracted at pressure P2 to mix adiabatically in the heater 1. The remaining kg of steam expands reversibly to P3 when M2 kg steam is extracted to mix with 1 minus M1 minus M2 kg feed water in the heat 2. The remaining steam expands reversibly to the condenser pressure. The heat and work transfer quantities of the cycle are as follows. You can see here this is actually the regenerative cycle with two direct contact feed water heaters this is the same thing again the flow diagram a simple flow diagram it consists of two stages of regenerative heating the efficiency is higher than that of the Rankine cycle it contains states of decreasing mass and it also utilizes the heating water the heating water is actually utilized in the regenerative feed water heating and also greater number of stages would give a closer approximation that is what is approximation of step cycle means there is also a loss in work output by the amount which is shown by the hatch data I will show you guys in the regenerative cycle for unit mass fluid it also reduces the operating cost due to the higher cycle efficiency and it increases the boiler size and hence the capital cost so you can see here this is what the equations on which we will follow and get this is with regeneration what is the mean temperature we get and without regeneration and the energy balance equation for heater 2 and the same thing the energy given off you can see in the regenerative feed water heating the energy given off by extracted steam in condensation is equal to the energy gain of feed water this is the turbine work and the turbine work is actually mentioned and it is actually changed you can see here the same thing is applied and in this the whole thing is actually rearranged again here you can see h1 minus h2 h2 dash minus h3 whereas you can see the h1 minus h4 dash so that is what by the usage of two feed waters you can get the turbine work so regenerative feed water heating the effects of regenerative feed water heating are as follows it actually significantly increases the cycle efficiency and reduces the heat rate that is operating cost it increases the steam flow rate, it reduces the steam flow to the condenser and if there is no change of boiler output, the turbine output drops. You can see here the regenerative cycle, the TS diagrams and the HS diagrams with two direct contact feed, uh, contact feed heaters. And this is what I have told, the reduction in heat rate, it increases the steam flow rate and there is drop in turbine output. And this is what the hatched area I was talking about that is the area where the loss in work output happens. So this is the regenerative cycle for a unit of unit mass of fluid. Thank you guys. Any questions please leave those in the comments box below. Have a good day. Have a nice time.